I'm Royal Society Entrepreneur in Residence here, so I'm here a day a week, I'm supported by the Royal Society and I'm here really to help potential entrepreneurs but also people working in business that want to know a bit more about commercialisation and also potentially working in a startup even if you don't want to do it yourself. So just understanding what it's like for those startup founders because lots of people join SMEs and have to work in them. The tech entrepreneurship angle is to really look at, over the weeks that we do this, how you can, in theory, spin off or license or get involved in a sort of startup company. Usually when you start off, if you're an individual and maybe you're becoming a consultant, you become a sole trader because it's the easiest route and it's basically you and you are the legal entity that's doing the business. So um, it has advantages in that it's relatively simple and so the accounting and the taxation is essentially you. Um, but it also has disadvantages in that it's harder, it's not impossible to employ someone, but you've got to be very careful because it's you that's the legal entity. You've got to watch your liabilities, make sure you've got obviously insurance, but sort of growing your business is harder. The, the clue is in the name, it's sole trader. And then for most tech companies, uh, certainly if you were spinning off from a university like this, um, it would be a limited company and those are the most common vehicles and that's where you're limited by shares and we go into that in a minute because it's the most relevant um, it's the sort of company that you see on the stock exchange but that's a public or public limited company because it's available on the stock exchange for people to buy and sell the shares in the company but the equivalent when you start is a private limited company so limited by shares and um, generally just a few shareholders Partnerships or limited liability partnerships, um, the most famous ones, of course, people like or groups like John Lewis, um, and, they're, and they're really, they're a bit like a limited company, but they are partners as opposed to shareholders. So the legal structure is slightly different. Um, you will see lawyers often are LLPs. That's actually because they have to be. They're not allowed to hide behind a limited company for their legal trade. They might have a limited company for some of their other activities. Um, but LLPs and partnerships, um, perfectly reasonable. Again, you've got to watch the agreements because you as partners are in effect liable and the taxation is a bit different as well. So it's kind of a hybrid between sole trader and limited company, which is why it's kind of where it is there. Uh, social enterprise is just an interesting one because you hear a lot about it now. And what that is, is it's a sort of a less capitalistic approach to business. Um, you can have a social enterprise as a limited company and indeed your limited company could be a social enterprise just through its constitution. But what happens in a limited company is that when it's profitable there are dividends that can be paid to shareholders. In a social enterprise those dividends tend to be reduced or not paid out at all and instead of dividends going to shareholders those profits are kind of retained to be used in the community or in the, the sort of social endeavours. So a social enterprise, there are a variety of them. You might see cooperatives, um, you might see CICs, which are community interest companies. Um, and a community interest company is very much like a limited company, but the dividends that you can pay are capped. And then, of course, the extreme of that is the charity, where you don't have shareholders, um, you have trustees, and you have your stakeholders, which are the people you're serving as a charity, there's no profits to pay out to shareholders. There are no shareholders. And any kind of profit that's made is retained in the charity to carry on with its work. Um, as a result, there's no tax on a charity. But the only way you can be a charity is to fit very strict rules, which is why you have a charities commission. And why, if you run a charity, you have a lot of reporting to prove that you are still acting as a charity. With a charity, you have trustees. With a limited company, you will have um, board of directors. And with, the, and with partnerships, you have partners. With a sole trader, it's you. And with a social enterprise, it's likely to be directors. It depends um, how, how the social enterprise is set up. So all of those people, if you like, behind the company have responsibility and liability. But that liability is protected a little bit in law as long as you as a director or a shareholder, not shareholder, sorry, a director or a trustee or a partner behave lawfully and with due care and attention. If, however, you behave unlawfully, you yourself open the, up to liability. What we talk about in terms of like a tech startup, 
assuming that it is aimed at being a high growth entity and its commercialization of tech. So it's probably not a social enterprise. It, it can be, but it probably isn't. Um, one of the things you hear about with startups and so on is this growth of the startup, but also investors coming in and what does that mean? And also what's really happening with shares and how is the company growing and how do you raise finance and so on? So we cover different bits of this over the coming weeks, but this kind of introduction here is to just show you what is happening when you raise money, which is usually key for a tech startup because it's usually expensive you know, in, because you need either equipment or there's new tech that you need to develop. Um, so it's all really, and I call it here a slice of the pie, it's all really about the, how your cake is sort of sliced up. And at the beginning, it's very straightforward. Usually there are founders and in a tech startup, it could be two or three or four founders or people that are very early in the research program and they decide to incorporate a company by a legal entity and as shown here there are two founders and they've both decided they're going to share equally so they each own 50 percent of the company that means simplistically they each own one share of two shares so you can create a company of two shares and have one each and that would achieve that um, Equally, if you've got four founders and you want to share equally, it's straightforward. You can issue four shares and have one each. Okay, So that's very straightforward. However, you probably want to issue more shares at the start and then just hold more of them between you. And you'll see why as you go forward with raising finance. Now, if you get it wrong, you can still issue more shares. You can actually do what's called a share split, which means you take the one and you split them into 100 or 1,000. But that just means filing more paperwork again. Um, so what you can do at the start is just say, actually, we're going to, in this situation, when we incorporate, let's have a thousand shares and let's have five hundred each. Now, yep. Should there be an upper limit at the beginning? No. So there's not an upper limit. You can have ten thousand or fifty, or however many hundreds of thousands you want. The only wrinkle is that certainly now in the UK, and it, this has changed recently in the last few years. It used to be possible that you could easily issue new shares at, for example, a penny a share. And the important thing is the shares, when they're issued or when they exist in the company, have some kind of initial value. Okay, they, That used to traditionally be called a par value. So what that means is, let's say you've decided to create a company of two shares. What you would normally do is say, well, they're two shares, they're a pound each, so it's two pounds in total, and each founder is effectively going to buy one share at a pound and what happens there is those two founders both put in one pound into the company and the, that one pound from each founder sits in the company in its bank account on its balance sheet as two pounds so the company has this balance sheet value at the start of two pounds okay however if you want to issue more shares at the start like 500 each when you incorporate a company now in the UK, the kind of default minimum is a pound a share. And I can't see any way of making it less, simplistically, unless you do a share split right at the start. So what you'd have to do is put in £500 each for your 500 shares, which would capitalise your company to £1,000. Um, and it meant, But it would mean that you as your founders have each spent £500 into the company. Money right, so strictly you do. The money should be, it's what, um, they, when you've done that, they're called paid up. It's called paid up capital. Now you could sit there without putting it in, um, but that's not good practice. And in theory, the company or the directors, they could be you, we'll come to that, can call on that and make sure that it's put in. So to keep it all nice and simple, you would normally put the money in. Okay. Um, so, but having said that, when you put the money in, that money can be put to work for the company. That belongs to the company now. Now, usually when you start a company, you do need some working capital, even if it's just to buy a domain name or a computer. So if you've both put in £500 and you've got £1,000 in your bank account, you can now spend that as the company. So you probably need to put some in. However, the reason having more shares is important is particularly in a startup where you expect to grow, you're going to be issuing new shares as investors come on board. Often, once you've incorporated, the only people you're going to be able to persuade to part with any cash are your friends and family. Yeah? So it's often called the friends and family round. It's the gullible people that you're able to persuade, that you know, come on, put some money into this venture. 
Yeah. And because they're friends and family, they trust you and, you know, are probably prepared to punt. So we often call it friends and family round. And what's happening here is you're not selling your shares. You're issuing new shares in the company that they are buying. So clearly, if you've only got two shares in the company, one between each of you, the best you can do is issue one more share, and they're all going to be split into three. Yeah, so one share to your friends and family, and they've instantly got a third. However, if you've got 1,000 shares in existence in your company, and you issue one share, you're obviously issuing a 1,000. So if you issue 10 shares, it's 1% of the company. If you issue 100 shares, you're issuing 10% of the company. Well, just over, because it's of the total. So it's 1,000 plus the new amounts of shares. As a result of that money going in, your company is now more valuable because you've effectively sold those shares at a higher price than you as founders issued them because you basically paid a pound per share and hopefully now you've effectively sold those shares for £10 or £20 or whatever each. So the value of the company goes up um, and that this is the trend that you want going forward as you raise money. So you can see this very easily in the next step. The next step is where you persuade a slightly more sophisticated investor, maybe someone that knows the business, maybe uh, somebody who's fairly wealthy, um, but not somebody who you may know as, in a, as a friend or family. And we often term this person an angel. So an angel investor is like an independent person that's coming along, really likes your business and is prepared to put in, in this case, hopefully a more substantial amount. So angel investors, again, it's how long it's a piece of string, but might typically put in between five and a hundred thousand pounds. It's that kind of tranche. So you're looking for tens of thousands of pounds from an angel investor. Clearly, what you're going to do is persuade them that the company is even more valuable. So you're going to hopefully charge them even more for each share. You're going to persuade them that that's worth doing. And the reason is, is that you're basically building a story. When you founded the company, there was nothing. Then you've spent some time working on it, perhaps generating some IP, some intellectual property, maybe filing a patent or in licensing a patent. Uh, you've done some work, you've perhaps uh, demonstrated that your product's going to work as a prototype. Your friends and family have come in, they've bought into the story, you've done a bit more work and so on. So you're growing the business and growing the potential as you go. And then the next bit of raising finance is where you actually get a sophisticated investor on board. And we normally call this Series A. It's the first true sort of raise of finance. And this might be a venture capital fund. So what a venture capital fund is, is it, it's usually a, a kind of a pool of money that's being managed and they are out looking for um, a return on that money on behalf of other investors. So people have put money into this investment company and the investment company goes around and puts money into a number of prospects and hopes at least some of them will succeed. So the difficulty with a venture capital investor is they've usually done this before. So the angel investor may have, but the venture capitalist almost certainly will have. So they're quite sophisticated and they know all the problems and they're also really looking out only for themselves. So this requires a lot of negotiation. There are lots of um, problems that can come along. We'll discuss that in a minute. But the end result that you're trying to get to is the same. You're basically trying to sell them shares at a higher price than anybody else has paid for them. And again, venture capitalists, it's probably going to be of the order of a few hundred thousand to maybe one or one and a bit million. That's the kind of size. And again, it depends on the size of the fund, how well they match with what you're doing. So usually these venture capitalists have certain niche areas that they're really keen on, like you know, materials or digital or biomedical and so forth. So there you go, that's a Series A. And you, you carry on, really. You can raise a Series B and a Series C, and they're usually ever larger amounts as your business is growing. And, and they can go up to tens and hundreds of millions of pounds um, if you're that successful. Having described all of that, the best way, of course, to understand what's going on is to create a table and, and you can do this in Excel and it's called a share capitalization table and it shows what's happening at each of those 
rounds of finance as to what's happening with the shares. So top is incorporation. It's really simple. And what I've shown here is actually the founders putting in some real money. Yeah, They're going to put in um, £10,000 each. And um, that's obviously going to give £20,000 into the company. It shows they've got real skin in the game to put in £10,000 um, and take the risk usually in you know, being employed by your company and this being your life, livelihood. Um, you know, that's a lot of money to put in, but it also is really good for future investors and friends and family. If they've seen you put in £20,000 between you, clearly you're not going to walk away the next day when it's a little bit troublesome. You're going to really try and get that money back and more. So, again, it's all up to how much you can afford. Uh, but in this case, 10,000 shares, pound a share, that means £10,000 has gone in from each founder, 50% ownership, and you can see on the, um, the, um, the line below that £20,000 has gone in, because it's in corporation, it's that first um, investment round, the post-money valuation of the company is £20,000. That's how much the company's worth on paper as a result. And if the money's paid in, goes into the bank account, and the shares are issued, that's paid up capital, as we explained. Friends and family, you can see now that we've decided through negotiation to sell shares at £2 a share. Okay, so we've persuaded the friends and family that it's now £2 a share, so it's doubled in value. Um, but the friends gonna can only afford £5,000, better than nothing for whatever might be the plan. So they put in £5,000, they only get 2,500 shares, new shares in the company. So now you can see that the total investment to date has been £25,000. Okay? But because it's now £2 a share, the post-money valuation has gone up to £45,000. And you can see as a result of this, the friend has now got 11% of the company. And the founders, therefore, have less overall, because yeah? it's 100% obviously. And that's what we call by, that's what we term dilution. So when you hear that people are diluted in their company, this is effectively what's happening. They're owning a lower proportion than they did at the beginning. The important things are the friend is not in control. He's only got 11% of the company. So in law, there are certain things that shareholders have a right to do. They, they're able to vote on certain matters around the company. Um, but they, he only has 11% or she only has 11% of the vote, in effect. Okay, so they're not in, she's not in control, he's not in control. And therefore, the founders still are. They've still got a good proportion. And that's actually what you want. The founders are driving the business. They need to remain in control. OK, the next round then, angel, you can see what's happening. You persuade the angel investor to part with 4,000, um, or to, sorry, buy 4,000 shares at £5 a share. So now we've increased the value of the shares again. In comes £20,000. Total raised to date 45,000. At that share price, post money valuation is now 132,000 or whatever. That angel has now got 15% of the company for that 20,000 pounds. The founders have been diluted, as has the friend. You can see the friend obviously has been diluted as well because he hasn't put any more money in. We'll come to that in a minute. But assuming that was the simple transaction, you've now got. Uh, a cake that's cut up into more pieces. So when you have an annual general meeting or a shareholders meeting and you have votes, unless there are other provisions in place, that's the proportion of the votes. And you can see that the founders are still in control if they both vote together. But if one founder doesn't agree with the other founder, but maybe the others team up, you can see how things can start swinging. So you can already see how democracy can start to play a role uh, even at this simple stage. Final part of the story on this slide, so you can see it happening. You've now got the VCs coming in. You've managed, this is a big round of finance now in, in this sort of simple scenario. They're going to spend £20 a share and they're going to end up with about 20%, 21% of the company. But now you can see that you've raised £185,000 and the value of the company is now over half a million. Yeah, So you can see how this sort of plays out. In reality, of course, these numbers could be very different. You know, they could be 10 times, depending on what you're trying to achieve. One of the tricks that the VCs will do, though, is they will come in in, um, in groups. So what might happen is there'll be a consortium of VCs. So two VCs could now take 40% between them. And that would be 
still not a controlling stake, but it could be a very, very influential stake. So sometimes you've got to watch that. Um, if you're going to have two VCs, what's effectively happening is they're mitigating their risk by sharing it between them. They're going to put in less money each, but because they're friends and they've worked together before, they're going to have maybe very similar end goals and they'll work together on the board, hopefully in a positive way, but when push comes to shove, they might use each other's powers to cause problems. So you've got to watch the dynamics. And having a, an Excel spreadsheet version of this is really useful because you can change the numbers and see what happens in, in real time, see how it's going to play out.